Thank you so much for watching this Bible study video. It is so great to be with you. Uh, make sure you like this video. It helps other people find it. And make sure that you leave any questions or comments in the comments below. We'll make sure those questions get answered. Lastly, make sure you hit the subscribe button somewhere on this page where you're viewing this, or you can click on our channel to subscribe. That way you get a notification every time we have a new video, not just Bible study or our live stream masses, but other things that we'll create and record and put out there for you throughout the course of the year. So great to be with you and hope to see you in person on Monday nights at 7.30. There's nothing like the in-person experience to Bible study. Uh, so really want to invite you to come. All levels of faith background and experience with the Bible are welcome. And so we hope to see you there. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to gather together once again, as a community to dive into your word. We know that in the word we encounter you, you are the word made flesh. And so we pray, Lord, that we would be primed and ready for this encounter. We would be unworried, undistracted. We would be focused, open, and ready to receive whatever you have in store for us. We pray, Lord, that in the midst of this Advent season, we would be constantly reflecting on how we can continue to prepare a way in our hearts for you how we can clear away the debris on the path, move obstacles, and allow that path between you and us to be unencumbered, to be easy, to be approachable. And so we pray, Lord, that we would welcome you with open hearts and gentle spirits into our own lives, into our hearts and minds tonight, and into this time as we dive into your word. And we pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit would guide us and be with us. We lay this time at your feet and we ask and pray that you remove any distractions, any worries, anything trying to pull our focus away from this time. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would allow this time to be fruitful and abundant for each one of us. Speak to us, Lord. We are your servants and we are listening. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome. We are in Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 2. And we're going to read verses 2 through 11. <clears throat> this is the gospel for this upcoming Sunday, which is the third Sunday of Advent, also known as Gaudete Sunday, which means rejoice, because we are halfway there. We are rejoicing in anticipation for the birth of Jesus. Uh, even though this uh, gospel passage is not very rejoicing, it's uh, kind of uh, confusing and fiery, so uh, it's kind of random. I don't know why they picked it for this day, but um, this comes from a section of Matthew where people are having different responses to Jesus. Okay, some people are very against Jesus, some people are having very positive reactions to Jesus, and there are others who have kind of a neutral reaction, and this is kind of one of the neutral reactions, and it's a bit confusing because it seems to come from John the Baptist, who knows Jesus. So we're going to read this, uh, this passage of Matthew 11, starting in verse 2, twice through. First time through, just get a picture for what is being said. So this is, John the Baptist is in prison. He is sending his disciples with a message to come and encounter Jesus, and this is their interaction that he is asking them to relay back to John the Baptist in prison. Matthew 11, verse 2. When John heard in prison of the works of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to him with this question, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus said to them in reply, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. As they were going off, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Then why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Amen, I say to you, among those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So now that you have this kind of interaction in your minds, we're going to read this a second time through. This time I invite you to listen more closely, see if there's any particular word or phrase that stands out to you. Again, we are reading Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. And again, listen more closely, see if a word or phrase stands out to you. Hold on to what that is, begin to reflect and ask, why is this standing out to me? How is the Lord trying to speak to me through this particular passage or word? When John heard in prison of the works of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to him with this question, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus said to them in reply, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. As they were going off, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Then why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Amen, I say to you, among those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to reflect back on this passage and the things that stood out to you and uh, begin to ask what stood out, why you think it did, uh, and then we'll discuss at the tables that we're at. Feel free to combine or you know, discuss with the people around you for the next five or ten minutes. If you're watching this later, please share your thoughts with us however you can. But for those of us here, we'll take about the next ten minutes to do that, and then we'll bring it back to the larger group for discussion. So in this passage, are there any things that are standing out, things that resonated with you, questions? <laughs> yeah, Michael. What does he mean by saying it's the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he? The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Well, uh, I, you can interpret it many ways, but I think um, first and foremost, I'm thinking of the baptism of John um, was just a symbol of repentance. It was not actual sacramental baptism yet. And so once those in the kingdom, how do you become part of the kingdom? You are initiated into the kingdom by being baptized and you become a new creation. A new self, as Ephesians says, I think in chapter 4, you put off the old self and put on the new self, you become a new creation. And so I think anyone who does that, down to the least, you know, the youngest infant, uh, would be considered greater than John the Baptist because they have this new sacramental identity. Um, but then you can just also paint the kingdom of God as just this much holier existence and like relationship with God that is beyond what they've experienced yet. But I think it, it has something to do with baptism. Yeah. Yes. Line 11. Amen. I say to you, among those born of women, mm -hmm. am I supposed to be, is it to be interpreted as uh, everybody in humanity? Or yeah. Or is also a, a more a deep meaning? Behind I, think the, I think the only thing you could potentially interpret from that is that that somehow in some way excludes Jesus, because even though he was born of a woman, his birth was different. So he may be excluding himself from that. But I think it's just a term that means everyone, because every person who's ever existed has been born of a woman, um, I guess, except for Adam and Eve. But, um, you know, depending on how you interpret Genesis. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Rick. I'm getting the impression that John didn't realize that Jesus was the Messiah. It would seem that way, right? Yeah. You know, which is interesting because, you know, John the Baptist and Jesus, I mean, they may not have grown up very near each other. We know that Mary went to the hill country in Judea to visit Elizabeth, who is John the Baptist's mom. And it's, it's probably likely that that's around where he grew up, which is not far from where he's preaching uh, at, when he's an adult. And Jesus grew up in the northern part near Galilee um, in Nazareth. And so... 
you know, but they would have seen each other at the pilgrimage feasts three times a year in Jerusalem. You know, when he came of age, they would have seen each other for probably different family events and gatherings and weddings and things like that. Um, so they probably knew each other. And I don't think this was something that was not obvious to Mary, Joseph, the people around Jesus. I mean, they all knew that, um, that Jesus was the Messiah, um, that it was proclaimed to them. And so John the Baptist's entire mission, his entire identity is to proclaim the, the, the way of the Lord. It says that even in the very beginning of Luke chapter 1 in the Canticle of Zechariah, uh, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. So already from the moment that John the Baptist is born, his father is claiming his identity, saying, You're going to prepare a way for Jesus that it's going to involve this kind of repentance, which is his ministry. So he knew this, I think, his whole life. This is what he'd been preparing for. I think the difficulty John the Baptist is having is he had a different idea of what Messiah meant. And a lot of people did. And I've said this before. I want to read to you. Uh, this is a section from 1 Samuel 2. Um, and this is Samuel's mother. Samuel was one of the first kind of prophets um, in the Old Testament. And his mother, his, her name is Hannah. Uh, who we named our daughter after, and uh, she has this song in First Samuel chapter two that's very similar to the Magnificat. Uh, Mary's, you know, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. But there's a line in it uh, toward the end where Hannah is saying this: "The Lord's foes shall be shattered; the Most High in heaven thunders; the Lord judges the ends of the earth. May He give strength to His King and exult the horn of His." anointed. Anointed means Messiah or Christos in Greek, Christ. And so all, that's one of many passages in the Old Testament and Psalms in the different books of Samuel and Kings, especially those associated with David and his line, talking about this powerful kingly Messiah who's going to come and overthrow all those who oppress the chosen people of God. So you can imagine at this time, the Jewish people, everything they've been through all of these different oppressive regimes they've seen and been under the power of, like Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, Rome, Persia, and Rome there being the current superpower, this is what they were waiting for. This is what they were hoping for. And so John the Baptist knew he was preparing the way for the Lord, that Jesus was the Messiah, but he had a different, potentially had a different image in his mind of what that meant. And so he's in prison now, in Herod's fortress, and he is sending his disciples to Jesus for one of two reasons. One, because he wants the disciples to choose for themselves. That could be the reason. John the Baptist may fully know, but he wants the disciples to go choose for themselves. But he may also be asking because he's like, dude, cuz, come on, bring the fire and brimstone already. Like, I'm in jail. Like, let's get this thing going. And Jesus has to send back this message of, you have a different idea of what it was that I came to do. But I assure you, I am who I've always said I was. Margo. Um, but I thought that when Jesus was baptized by the Holy Spirit, John was there and said mm -hmm. that. Yes. So yeah. how, could he, how, how could he have a question at that point? Yeah, I don't think he questioned that Jesus was the Messiah. I think the question is stemming from what the Messiah was coming to do. Okay. Yeah, so that's why he sends this. This is a very, like, you know, kind of big brother. Remember, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus, okay? And, and they're cousins, they're family, and this, was, this is in a culture where extended family is as close as immediate family. Like, this is, this is your tribe, your kin. And so I read it kind of as this, like, are you the one who's in to come? Who's going to come, or should we wait for another? Like, come on, like, pick it up here. Like, he's, he's kind of sending him this passive-aggressive, like, come on, let's get this thing going. Like, what are you waiting for? And John, and Jesus has to send, you know, this, this message back of, this is not, you know, this idea you have and that you're really excited for is maybe not what I came to do. I came to do more than that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of like what you're saying that John the Baptist, his disciples, his friends, he, I think John knows. Mm -hmm. and, he, and, he, and he just basically tells his friends, that, that's, that's the Messiah. That's Jesus. Go, go, you know, go check it out. Yeah. I think, I, I think he's... Well aware, and then yeah. they may be saying, "Oh, he's going to get you out on this," and like, yeah. and John may know, like, well, I don't know. But yeah, you guys go, you know, see for yourself. Yeah, I think you can interpret it either way. I think there is reason to possibly believe that John the Baptist did have a mistaken idea 
of what the Messiah was because he sends them with the question. And the way Jesus responds, he gives him snark right back. Did you hear the last line of his response? He says, and blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. You go tell him, you know. Happy, blessed is kind of the word for beatitude, makaroi in Greek, which means like abundantly blessed or happy. Happy is the one who doesn't take offense at me. Like you're going to be a whole lot happier if you just accept who I am, because so enjoy prison, you know, like maybe if you had done things my way, you wouldn't have ended up there, you know, but that's not true. Jesus ended up in jail anyway, so, or in jail of one kind or another. So yeah, but you know, there, there's this rapport here, but the way Jesus responds, I think does indicate that there is supposed to be, the author is trying to convey some kind of doubt. Now, whether that doubt is something they want the disciples of John the Baptist to witness and respond to, or if it's actually something that John the Baptist himself is experiencing, is kind of unclear. It's left to either interpretation, and either interpretation, I think, would be valid. You know, either would be, you could rationally arrive at either from the text. There's, there's no indication, though, too, that John got the memo, right? <laughs> back, from, back from his disciples. Yeah, we don't know, because he dies shortly, shortly after this. Yeah, he's beheaded in um, in Herod's palace. Yeah. So hopefully he knew. I'm sure he knew. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if this is the wrong train to go now. Okay. All right. <laughs> in line seven, he mentions a reed that is swayed by the wind. Yeah. Is there any symbology to a reed? Because he, no, you're looking panicked. <laughs> because he then mentions the idea of fine clothing like a king, and then he mentions the prophet. So I'm wondering if the reed is also related to being a priest, as Jesus is priest, prophet, mm. and king. And then he says, yes, like I am those things. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Okay. That when I think of a reed, I think of a clarinet, you know, or re reeded instruments. You know, I think of music. I just didn't know if it was used in like religious. It may, it may be. But I think what, what, is, what he's saying here when he says a reed swayed by the, the wind, what that means is like a reed is a plant first and foremost, you know, and you pluck reeds in order to make the reeds that play instruments. And what he's saying is like, what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see someone who just goes with the wind, who just goes with what everyone else wants? You know, that's what that turn of phrase means, you know, a reed swayed by the wind. It means it goes where everyone expects it to go. So did you go out to hear something comfortable and easy that everyone expected? No, you didn't. John the Baptist is like, he looks like a lunatic, like he's wearing camel's hair and he's shouting at the most desolate place on earth, repent, and people are being baptized. It's nuts. You know, this is like the first century equivalent of a circus. So no, they didn't go to see that. He's trying to, he's trying to tell them like, you know who I am. You know who I am and what I came to do. So if you have these doubts, like go back to the desire. Go back to that question. What are you looking for? What brought you out to the desert to see John in the first place? What was he pointing you toward? What was that hunger that was welling up within you? And then the second things that he mentioned, second and third things, uh, someone dressed in fine clothing. Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Where's John the Baptist? He's in Herod's royal palace in prison. So it could be a dig, a little dig at John the Baptist. I think it's more of a dig at Herod. And Jesus saying, like, look, I'm going to be just as spicy as John the Baptist was. Just you wait. You know, and you read along forward in Matthew chapter 23 when he's scathing the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, calling them broods of vipers and hypocrites over and over and over again. Like, he's, he's coming to throw down. He's just not doing it yet. You know, and then after that, um, what did you come to go out and see? A prophet. Yes, but more than that. Okay, remember, the Jewish people, they hadn't had a prophet since Malachi. Malachi was the last prophet in the Old Testament, the most recent of the Old Testament prophets. And his book was written somewhere in the, the 5th or 4th century before Christ. This is 450 years without any prophet, any voice of God telling them, this is where you're supposed to go, this is how you're supposed to correct, this is what God is doing in you, a chosen people. And they probably felt lost. Did we betray God again? Are we going to go into exile again? Did we do something else wrong? Are we turning away? Did, was this because of idolatry? What is going on? And when they hear this inkling of someone speaks out there different than everyone else, they're not like this reed swaying in the wind, going with the flow of what everyone else is saying, like the rabbis do, saying the things that are comfortable and easy to hear. He's saying something that sounds like a prophet. 
It sounds like something that was difficult and challenging the powers that be, challenged the status quo. That's why all the prophets end up getting stoned and thrown out and disrespected, thrown down in a well, because they say hard things. You know, there's no, not a prophet in the Old Testament that was well-liked and who sugarcoated things. Not a single one. Nobody ended up liking them in the end because they said the hard things that needed to be said. And the people didn't want to change. They didn't want to turn away. And so they responded and took that anger, that insecurity they had about, we can't get back in right relationship with God. They took it out on the messenger. And the same thing happens here to John the Baptist. He was preaching against Herod and his unlawful marriage because Herod was Jewish. And that's what got him in jail. So he's not going with the flow. I think one big thing we can interpret from this passage and we can think about is kind of the, the, I think we've all arrived at it at some point in our lives where we've prayed this question. Jesus, why aren't you fill in the blank? Or Jesus, why won't you fill in the blank? Jesus, why isn't fill in the blank? You know, we kind of challenge, why aren't you who I thought you were going to be? Why isn't this happening how I thought it was going to happen? Why isn't my life what I thought it was going to be? You know, I thought this person was going to get better. I thought I'd have this relationship forever. I thought that I was going to be really successful in this career. You know, I thought that I would finally be happy when I get this job, I get this promotion, I retire, I have kids, whatever it is. And life throws its curveballs, and we can turn that on the Lord, and we can say, God, Jesus, why isn't this like this? Why isn't this fill in the blank? And that's really, I think, the example that's being provided here by John the Baptist. He's either a vessel for this opportunity for us to really have to say, do I really know, am I really open to, rather, who Jesus really is? Or do I have a preconceived notion about him? Okay, he can be just the vessel for that message, or he himself is even struggling with that doubt. And that would be okay. Because what does Jesus do? Does he condemn John the Baptist? Does he say, oh, and that guy doesn't know what he's talking about anymore, or he was wrong? No, he praises him for what he did, and he reaffirms his identity as someone who's greater than a prophet, quoting the Old Testament passage from Malachi, the last prophet. That's from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Now I am sending my messenger. He will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will come suddenly to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you desire. See, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. That's Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. The last prophet, the prophecy about the next and final prophet in John the Baptist. Jesus reaffirms that identity despite his doubt. Reaffirms who he is and then commends him for the greatness of who he is. But then doubles down and says, those who are in the kingdom of God are even greater than he. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's like kind of like a turning point where everyone at this point is like so confused and maybe gospel, even John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. And he's like, is it, is it the right one? Is it the right one? And Jesus is like that reassurance that sometimes is just so nice to hear. Yeah. Yeah, and Jesus didn't exist in a vacuum. There were other people who claimed to be the Messiah. There were other people before Jesus who had claimed to be the Messiah. There were other people after Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah. Actually, there were a lot more beforehand. I don't know if too many after, but Jesus kind of changed things. So, But there were a lot of people before that. You can read about that, I think, in like Acts chapter 4 or 5. The, the Sanhedrin is discussing what to do with Peter and John. And Gamaliel, the rabbi who's very wise, who taught St. Paul, who was his rabbi, he says, you know, we should just wait. Because remember these other false messiahs? They had thousands of followers, and when they died, they all scattered because they weren't legitimate. But if this one is real, then we will know it by the fruit of their ministry. And if he isn't, then it will dissipate just like all the rest have. Yeah, Greg. Last line. Okay, there's been none greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Mm -hmm. So are there different levels of ecstasy in heaven? Different, you know, levels of engagement, pleasure? So this is an area of theological speculation, but um, logically... Uh, you can arrive at at a conclusion that says yes, because everyone in heaven is completely filled, completely filled, overflowing in abundance. But you can think of the, the soul that we bring to heaven, the character we bring to heaven, the person that we are that we bring to heaven, if we get there, is, is like, a, like a cup. 
Okay, and when we're in heaven, our cup is full. Everyone's cup is full. But that doesn't mean everyone's cup is the same size. Some people, through the good works in their life, through their dedication to God, their relationship with him, their ability to endure suffering, their cup has expanded to be able to receive more from God in life. And they will experience the fruit and the reward of being completely filled in heaven. Now, those who have the small, the person who has the smallest cup, who maybe has a thimble of just spiritual openness, they're still going to experience the same ecstatic, abundant joy from being completely filled up when they get to heaven. But we cannot know until we get to heaven. And we may not even be able to determine when we get to heaven because everyone is so filled. What would it, you know, is that full? Is that full? Yes, they're both full. Like, how do you compare them? Uh, but we won't necessarily be able to know whose vessel is larger than anyone else's because we'll all be, be having the experience of being equally filled. Does that make sense? But the level, if your cup is larger, you're going to have more ecstasy, more pleasure of being in heaven, right? Potentially. You experience more than the, than the other person. But if, you, if, if you have a small cup, okay, you're going to be satisfied to the level that you are. You're going to be full, completely full. Yeah. There's no more full you could be. You are for the level that you are. And you're not going to know that some saint, their cup is larger and they're maybe experiencing more. But they're not more full. They're just full. But what are they? That's the problem. It's like a mystery. You know, there's no more full than anyone could be, yet everyone is full. To their level. You might see it that way on earth, but we, I don't think we'll have that conception of it on, in heaven. I'm not, I'm not arguing this that I necessarily think that, but I think it's a very, it, it, some saints and theologians have written about it this way. And it's very, it's very interesting to me because you can see that born in human experience. We experience God that way here in life. Someone can be completely filled by God and so can another person. And yet the capacity to which God can fill them and work through them can vary. And yet both of those individual people can report, I feel totally abundantly blessed and filled by the Lord. And so on earth, we play the comparison game. Nobody does in heaven. All, our only experience in heaven will be that we're all full. So to the degree that we want to experience rewards and the joy of heaven, that compels us in this life to make that vessel as large as possible. So it matters more here than it does there. Because there, we'll all be full. And full is equal. Full equals full. Doesn't matter how large the volume, full is full. So whether you have a thimble or whether you have a water reservoir tank as your soul, you're still full. And you will not feel less full and you will not be able to be more full. You will be the fullest you can possibly be and that will be the fullest joy, love that you can possibly experience. Yeah, Ian. This kind of reminds me of like the whole human psychology of it from was it last week or two ago with the with, uh, you will not know when the thief will rob your house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like if, if even for each unique person, there was a measurement. Well, then I mean, people would just game the vibe, right? Or, yeah. You know, like I did my, I did my. I'm a retired. Twenty six. Yeah. I'm retired now. No more good deeds. Yeah, exactly. So it just also, yeah, just I can't even imagine what I would even do with the temptation that we would bear, knowing how much we would need to do to feel full. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But I just thought that was... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Matt? I just really like the thought of people having these different cups, but yeah, you're not really caring what the other person's cup looks like. Yeah. I feel like your relation to God should be very personal. It's like, mm -hmm. if you want to experience like a more intense, you know, relationship with God in heaven, it's like, then you're going to do more on this earth. Mm -hmm. It won't really matter if like Ian, you know, did... A different thing, and I did a different thing because, in the end, I'm not going to be looking at this cup. Oh, well, exactly. I love the bigger cup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. I think in heaven we won't know or even perceive that. Yeah. You know, because we will be the fullest we can possibly be. You know, so the area of speculation is: is our level of possibility different? And if it is, that has more to do with what we do here than it does in heaven, because heaven is all about abundance. You know, and we will not be able to to even know or compare or have the perception that anyone is more full or less full than we are because we're all full. We just want to be as close to God as possible. Yeah. So my closeness to God might be different than someone else's, but yeah. I'm still going to feel fulfilled. Yeah, exactly. Margo? The thing I think about heaven in terms of highest places, 
I think, because I've said it to people, people that you know that have suffered so much in their lives, mm -hmm. not, not based on anything they've done, but from the health and their spiritual and they're giving things, but they've just suffered thing after thing. I mean, we're probably going to all know a few people. Mm -hmm. I just always say, okay, you're going to be next to God. Because <laughs> they're, I mean, they've, they've just endured so much. Sure. That I just feel like that's the fair thing to do. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know they say like the the table in heaven is round, you know. So like we do have the right and the left who sits at the right hand of God. That's Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit is sometimes often depicted at the left or Mary. Um, but that that we can we don't necessarily interpret it that there is a hierarchical closeness, because in terms of the fullness of the cup that we have, we're as close as we can possibly be. You know, we're all next to Jesus in heaven. It's crazy. Alex. Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all things you will be successful on account of me and rejoice and be glad for your reward and never is great. Mm -hmm. For so they persecute the prophets who live before you. What do you think that represents in what you're talking about, about what Margaret just pointed out, for those that suffer greatly mm -hmm. and serve for the sake of God, is that what they're referencing and having a greater reward, it just has a greater reward. Yeah, it could be. You could interpret it that way very easily. Those who are persecuted have learned how to endure certain things. They've learned how to let go. And so their capacity for being filled is larger. You know, So if you imagine our life is kind of like we all have this cup, but it's full of stuff. And suffering, sacrifice, being persecuted, it often involves having to take stuff out of that cup. I can no longer hold on to this, or this is taken away from me. And throughout the course of our life, our vessel empties. And to the degree which some are emptied more than others, then can determine how much space is there left. You know, but that doesn't mean in heaven we'll still have kind of junk in our cup. That just might affect the open space that we have in order to be filled. You know, so yeah, I can you can interpret it very easily to support that argument. It makes me think of like Padre Pio, mm -hmm. who bore the stigmata for 50 years. Yeah. And the suffering that he endured and the blessings that he brought into this world as well. Yeah. What, what reward, you know, even though he says he's going to stand at the gates until the kingdom come, mm -hmm. you know, until the last of, of, of his children arrive. Yeah. I wonder, you know, for saints like that that suffered so greatly, is there a, a better seat? I don't want to say better seat, like you said, the table's round. But does someone is someone closer to God per se? Or yeah. Reward or treasure? I think about also the mansions. It speaks like I go to prepare a place for you. Mm -hmm. The mansions of my Father's kingdom are great. You know, like the people of the abundant life here, or mm -hmm. the people that suffer, will there be a counterbalance in heaven? Mm -hmm. I don't think it will be directly corresponding to it. I think it deals more with the personal disposition of someone's heart rather than, you know, poverty or, or wealth. But I think there is something to that, that Padre Pio, he had this mentality of, of being willing to sit in the longing for the Lord. If you read Padre Pio's writings, the thing that sustains him is this, in, this like insatiable desire he has for the Lord, even in very dark moments. He just still can return back to this, like, all I want is to be with the Lord. And that's what gets me through. That's what sustains me. And so when you can empty yourself of everything else, all you have is a greater capacity to be filled. And so I think that image that Padre Pio says of himself, that I want to be the one who's at the gates of heaven and who comes in last waiting for all my children to enter, that shows the disposition of someone who's willing to allow himself to wait and expand in that waiting as large as he possibly can so that he can be as, as filled as possible in heaven. You know, I've quoted St. Augustine several times over the past couple months, the, this, this um, passage from St. Augustine where he, he talks about why does God cause us to wait? And it's because he uses this analogy that if, uh, if you're going somewhere uh, and you're, you're getting, you know, someone's giving you like a deposit of something or you're going to pick up wine or something, I can't remember the exact analogy he uses, but if you know like you're going to go get a big reward, you're going to try and stretch your wineskin. You're going to try and, you know, stretch out your sack to be able to get as much grain as possible. And so he says, like, in the same way, God will sometimes withhold things for us so our desire will increase and that the vessel that we are will stretch so that we can finally receive all that God wants to give us. And I think that is a good analogy of 
the transition between our life on, on, on earth and when we get to heaven. On earth is our experience of that desire, that waiting for the Lord and that stretching. And that some of us will stretch to larger volumes than others spiritually, but when we get to heaven, we'll all be full. And we'll experience it, you know, I guess in an earthly sense to different degrees, you know. Yeah. With uh, prophets like John the Baptist and even Jesus himself, right, there were people who, who didn't believe or weren't sure or they were very faithful, but I'm not sure about this guy. Mm -hmm. um, but in that of reference for the present day, um, how does it, how, how are we supposed to kind of navigate that, maybe even according to what the church has mm -hmm. said? And I also, just from what I understand, the church may not always be the first word on things or looking out for people who are the new prophets, but they certainly always are the last word on, on something. Mm -hmm. So, like, just from what you know about, like, what the church is, are, are we, like, culpable if we miss someone who reveals something, but we're not participating in that, but we're doing what we're supposed to be doing? Like, how do we navigate in this age, like, mm. the prophets, if, if, right? Because that okay. happen, right? I guess, right? Well, okay, so I see what you're saying. Um, so a prophet is someone who reveals divine revelation. Yeah. And in terms of the divine revelation that matters to us, in terms of like matters of faith and morals, the church teaches that public revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. So that the apostles had this prophetic role. They, weren't, they were sometimes called prophets, but they were the apostles. That was their office. The last person to really hold the office of truly prophet was John the Baptist. Um, so you do have people in the modern eras of the church who speak prophetically. They speak as if they have a word of knowledge from God, but that office of prophet in the same way that it was in the Old Testament is no longer necessary because all that was intended to be revealed was revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and in the teaching of the apostles. So we won't be culpable for anyone else who's like, I'm the new John the Baptist. We're like, no, you're not. Like we have, we already know everything we need to know. Like you're not going to tell us anything new. Like. That's what God is, Jesus came to reveal. However, if someone is speaking prophetically, um, I use an ABC kind of a, a mentality to see if, discerning if what they are saying is actually from God or if it's from them. And that is if it's A, if it's affirming, B is if it's biblical, and C, if it's Christ-like. If it's affirming, if, meaning it's something positive, it's encouraging, it's something to build you up, not tear you down. It's biblical, meaning it jives with what's in Scripture, and it sounds like something Jesus would say. Then that person could very well be speaking prophetically, or the Holy Spirit could simply be speaking to me through the vessel that that person is. But it's not the same as those who were prophets in the time of Scripture, who reveal divine revelation. Yeah? I, I like to kind of sum it up for me is the, uh, Matthew 11, number 6. How happy are those who have no doubts about me? Mm -hmm. I, mean, that's, I mean, we're saying a lot of stuff, but when it comes to that little bit, taking that leap, that step, like, you know, that's, you're the one, you know, you, yeah. you, are, you are God. And so, and that's what people wonder, is it, is that him? Is that him? Yeah. And anybody says, you know, it's basically the person who, who does believe in me, you know, they, they got, it. You know, yeah. it's, he's trying to break it down real simple. You know, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think as you're as you're saying that, I'm imagining. You know, we all have to kind of come to this moment where we're before the Lord in in our life, hopefully throughout our earthly life. And Jesus is saying to us, "Are you going to are you going to receive me, or are you going to stick with the version of me that you have in your head? You know, are you ready to accept me for who I am and what I desire to be in your life?" Or are you just going to hold on to this image you have of me? That's safe, that's kind of, that you've created this construct that we have. Because none of us know Jesus to the fullest capacity. We don't. We can all know Jesus more. And so if we're attached to this idea of Jesus that we can't let go, we don't allow Jesus to deepen, be newer, be, have a more transformed uh, idea of him, a relationship with him in our, in our mind and in our lives, then we are uh, falling into this trap. You know, the, the word here actually, uh, and blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. The word there for offense at me is scandalitze. It's where we get the word scandal or scandalized. You know, and, and when we have an inaccurate image of Jesus, it can scandalize our perception of faith and it can scandalize other people. You know, we can ac accidentally pass on a false idea or image of Jesus to others. When people see us as a Christian example and yet we respond in anger 
or we hurt other people, or we fail to forgive, or we fail to be generous or good stewards of what we've been given. That can send a false image. But even in our own personal relationship with Jesus, we can get these false images of Jesus, like the health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel. If I do good things and I'm faithful, then good things should happen in my life. That is a predominant, subconsciously believed reality by Christians all across America, Catholics as well. And it is completely antithetical to scripture, but it's taken root because it's kind of conjoined with the American idea of like manifest destiny, that you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you can achieve anything if you do the hard work. And Protestant Christianity took that on, it became kind of a televangelistic whirlwind when you have these televised preachers preaching this you know, message of prosperity, that if you do what God wants you to do, if you pray, if you give to the church, then you will be blessed. And we, we can fall into a false idea that Jesus is an ATM machine or that he's Santa Claus, or that he's Zeus, that, you know, whatever it is, um, that when we go to him, we have this preconceived idea of what we're going to get. Usually judgment or, uh, like, love without question and without a need for us to change. You know, we, it's like anywhere on the scale between, like, you know, brutal judge or, um, you know, hippie love train. You know, it's anywhere on that scale, anywhere in between is how we see Jesus. We have to recognize that the reality of who Jesus is doesn't even fall in the middle of that spectrum. It's completely off the spectrum. Like, we, we don't even have the capacity of fully understanding who he is. But he's constantly challenging and inviting us to question our image of him, our relationship with him. Can it be deeper? Can I let go of these preconceived ideas or notions I have about faith, about what a relationship with God is supposed to look like, about what my faith and my prayer life is supposed to be? Can I stop comparing can I stop holding on to this idea that God is going to do things my way and let go of my way so that I can begin to let my way be conformed to his way? All of those things are questions that, that this part of this passage, I think, really inspires. Greg? One more comment about this last, you have the least of my brothers thing, you know, mm-hmm. or the least of the kingdom. It kind of bothers me because I remember a previous gospel that we had where Jesus and the apostles are going along. He hears two of them behind him, you know, they're BSing between themselves. I'm greater than you, or I'm closer, all this mm-hmm. stuff. He turns around and like, he lets into them. Yep. Like they're with the devil or something for thinking that. Mm-hmm. So they're thinking one is better than the other, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And he does not accept that. Mm-hmm. But right here he says, yet the least in the kingdom. Why would he say the least in the kingdom? I would say because those two disciples weren't thinking in a kingdom-oriented way. Yeah, for them. So, but he turned on, he, he put them in their place. Yeah. But, but here, in a different way, in a different time set, then, then he, he creates a comparison, a differentiation. Yeah. That's why I, I was commenting in the beginning that I think this has to do with baptism. I think this has to do with the fact that we, when we come to know Jesus, when we become part of the kingdom of God, it's because we've been initiated into the kingdom through baptism. And so... James and I believe it was James and John in one of the Gospels where they're the ones bickering. Who can sit at your right or left? Or let's call down, you know, thunder and fire and brimstone on these people. Um, and Jesus rebukes them. And that's because they're not thinking from a kingdom mentality. They're thinking in an earthly way. And so there is a comparison. We could, Jesus compares all the time between the earthly and the kingdom of God. You know, and how we need to ascend or escape our earthly attachments and live in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven that is at hand. So that is a comparison to make. But once you get into the kingdom of heaven is what he is saying. Like anything that that we compare here on earth, even the smallest thing in the kingdom of heaven is greater than all of it. That's the comparison that matters, I think, in that verse. Yeah, Chris. Oh, Alex. I was just going to say that a lot of the warrior god, warrior prophets, Mm -hmm. When you say that that hadn't been fulfilled in the first coming, but a lot of it could be fulfilled in the second coming, if you look at Revelation, how Jesus hmm. used to come and you know, bring a pretty, pretty intense. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you could, you know, because I would say a lot of that warrior terminology was fulfilled by Jesus. It just was about him being a warrior against death and sin and suffering and the devil. It wasn't the earthly type of warrior image that everyone expected. So I would say they were all fulfilled, just not in the same way, not in a militaristic way. 
In the second coming, you could have that same interpretation. That, but I don't think, again, that it would be meant to be interpreted literally. Because when Jesus comes, it's going to be nothing like the first time. We know that. But also, when we hear about like the end of time, we hear about these things of like um, the, the lion laying down with the lamb. And you know, the, I think it was the, the, the first reading or one of the readings we had just yesterday, that the child will lay his head in the adder's lair, you know, which is a poisonous snake. I think. And so like there'll be no there'll be no uh, suffering division between creatures between us and creation there'll be no death there'll be no worry. And so instead of this very like warrior like type of image it almost has the opposite. It has this image of complete unity, peace and tranquility when it comes about. But there is also a lot of this militaristic imagery in Revelation, but that has more to do with uh, the the prophecies that are from Revelation that are associated with the overthrow or Rome coming in to uh, overthrow Jerusalem um, that, that John was prophesying was about to happen. So that's the hard thing about interpreting Revelation is that Revelation is about the fall of Jerusalem to Rome in the year 70, and it's also about the second coming. And they're both kind of layered on top of each other. And you have to kind of pick apart, is this prophecy about both of those? And how is it applied to both? Or is it about just one of those events or the other? So I don't know if I'm around for the second coming. We'll find out. <laughs> but um, I, would, I would be one to, to interpret it based on the first coming, that if it wasn't the way that Jesus intended and that he came in a very upside down way the first time, I would imagine there'd be something, some kind of similar quality, even though it would be very different. Um, I don't imagine it's going to be, well. Yeah, I mean, that's just all very symbolic. But I, I mean, as I said that, I got the image of like the Son of Man prophecy of, of the Son of Man coming on clouds with armies of angels. And I was like, well, that looks pretty militaristic, too, you know. So, but I don't think it's going to be in the way that we expect it in an earthly sense. You know, there, there's, there's not, well, at least there's not currently, maybe there will be at the end of time, there's not some big superpower oppressing the you know religious small chosen people in the world like Christianity has spread to the entire world, you know a third of the world are Christians and so that kind of desire to tap into a very militaristic Messiah is not I think as fervor, not as, as zealous as it would have been then at the time. So there will be elements like there was with Jesus, but they were much different than people expected. Potentially there will be potential elements like that, but but I I'm one to think not. Yes. Going back to the discussion of John, the kind of study, it's really cool because you feel the two sides that you can uh, take on why he sent the disciples. Like, mm -hmm. He's setting up his, his disciples like Creek family. Yeah. Like, okay, are you using the disciples like Pope's <laughs> Rock? Or, or the other side, though, would be because really nice because even in the sense that it's even John down. Yeah. And, you know, like, to compare like, ourselves, like, you know, like, Sometimes we even doubt, like, so it's like nice to know that like John's like our brother and that too. Like he not even doubted that Jesus met him. Mm -hmm. Not only where he was at in prison, like but he also like glorified John too. Like, man, yeah. Like, not only like doubting the Messiah, but also like John's so awesome. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. There's a difference between a doubt and a difficulty. And a doubt is something that stops you, right? It's like I I doubt the existence of God. That stops you. But if you have a difficulty with the existence of God, then it's, it, it demonstrates you're wrestling with it. You're seeking to understand. I think what this is demonstrating is that John had a difficulty. He didn't have a doubt. If he had a doubt, he wouldn't have sent disciples. He would have just been, forget it. You know, he was the wrong guy. He had a difficulty. And in the same sense, I think Mary had difficulties. I think it was probably very difficult for Mary, even knowing the truth and keep continuing to persevere on the way of the cross, to see her son battered and bloodied carrying that cross to Calvary. I imagine it was a huge difficulty holding him taken down from the cross. You know, all the doubts, even though she knew all of these, they all knew all these prophecies. He had told them that the son of man was going to be risen from the dead. And yet they were afraid. But they continued to gather. They continued to be hidden away together. They continued to remain a unit. And I think there was something there that indicated it was, it was not a doubt. It didn't stop them. But it was a huge obstacle of grief for them to try and consider how do we go forward. But I think it was more so a difficulty. I think that's what John is, is exhibiting here. And I think it's, it's an encouragement for all of us that it's okay to have difficulties. But we shouldn't let them turn into doubts and stop us. 
That until we arrive at the answer, until we arrive at the truth, we should not stop. And the road there will be paved with many difficulties. There'll be many obstacles to understanding who God is and what he's doing in our life and why certain things happen, why suffering exists. And we'll have them over and over again throughout the course of our life as we go through different phases and different experiences of life. And it's okay to have those difficulties, but if we resign them to doubts and we fall into despair or hopelessness, that's when it becomes something that can turn to sinful behavior or become an obstacle to God working in our life. Because then we've shut the door and said, you're not who I thought you were. And so there's no room for you in my life. But the difficulty says, you're not who I thought you were, but I'm going to try and figure out who you really are because this is really confusing. But it's just that, that, that little shift in understanding, that little shift in motivation, and knowing that we can trust God even if we don't understand him. And we never fully will. And I think that's the brilliant thing that this gospel demonstrates, is that even in, even in difficulty, Jesus invites the question, he responds to it in love, and then he affirms the good in John. He does not focus on the difficulty, does not focus on the negative. He affirms his role and his mission in bringing about the kingdom of God. And he does the same thing for you and me. When we go to confession, when we confess things to him in prayer, when we mess up, Jesus does not look at you and focus on the negative and say, oh, why'd you do that? That was so bad. He says, look at what I've called you to do. And even though you have difficulties, even though you may have doubts, I am with you. I am who I said I would be for you. So let go of your other ideas or images of me or how you thought your life was going to go because I am doing something beautiful in you now. I can write straight with crooked lines and no matter how crooked the path of your life has been, God will use it and he will bring about your greatest possible good and he will fill that vessel that you are, whether it's the smallest thimble or the largest container, he will fill it in heaven. And we can prepare for that in the good works, the prayer, the sacrifices, the things that we do in this life to prepare to be even more filled in the abundance of heaven. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this word, this passage, how it challenges us to consider how well we know you, whether we have a false idea of you that we are attached to, whether we have a comfortable view of God and our relationship with you, and how we need to let go, how we need to grow, how we need to lay down our own plans, our own idea of what our lives should look like, and allow our will to be more conformed to yours. We pray, Lord, not just in heaven, but in this life, you would fill us, that you would expand our ability to be filled, the vessel that is our lives, that you would help us to empty our lives of everything else that is not of you, to let go of attachment, and to seek our ultimate fulfillment and identity in you alone. And when we do that, and it's borne by the good deeds and the prayerful acts of our lives, we will be happier, we will be blessed, we will know you as you are, and as you reveal yourself to us. And so we pray in the midst of this Advent season, as we prepare a way for the Lord, in the words of John the Baptist and in his mission, we pray that you would help that same reality happen in our lives. That we would remove the things from our life that are obstacles to you, so that we may be more abundantly filled. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.